All right, greetings everybody and uh, welcome to my lecture series. Uh, this is of course part of a series dealing with Canadian history and if you haven't had a chance yet I'd recommend looking at my lecture entitled The Causes of World War I uh, because that will set you up for where we begin today. I'm not going to get too much into the causes at all because I'll assume that you've done that or at least you've done your own research to, to have an understanding of, of how this war started um, and uh, definitely will help you understand uh, Canada's role, of course, as well. Canada had a population of roughly 8 million people uh, in 1914, and over 600,000 Canadians served in World War I, and there were close to 60,000 Canadians killed in this war. When you look at the percentage of people who enlisted and those who died in comparison to our population, it's a pretty staggering and stunning figure for a nation our size to make such a dramatic uh, impact on this war. In addition, though, Canada's reputation really developed. Um, we had uh, sort of come to our own, if you will, that, that, that by the end of World War I, we had had considerable success in uh, the British Expeditionary Forces as well as the Canadian Expeditionary Force, which most Canadians were predominantly a part of, of course, um, that there was a tremendous amount of acknowledgement from our allies at the end that Canada had contributed significantly in this war. Um, I also have a three-part series dealing with World War I, but that's more sort of looking at it from a global perspective, focused predominantly on, on, on uh, the Western Front. This lecture, of course, is going to deal specifically with Canada, Canada's involvement, and uh, we'll also be looking at sort of big picture items as well, uh, where we begin to talk about Canada in the context of those battles. Um, so let's move ahead here. So, although we had become a political union in 1867, Britain still controlled the foreign policy of all its dominions. When Britain declared war on Germany, Canada, along with the rest of the British Empire, was automatically at war. Now, in saying that, there was a, a high degree of enthusiasm to support uh, the Empire, to support Great Britain. Many Canadians saw this war in Europe as our war. Britain and France were, of course, allied with Russia against the Central Powers, uh, Austria-Hungary and Imperial Germany. So from a Canadian perspective, French Canadians and English Canadians could feel a certain amount of solidarity that their involvement in the war was helping Britain and France in the old country. Um, while enthusiasm for the war was pretty strong in the beginning of the war for Quebec, that does change, and we're going to talk about why there is a shift in Quebec's position as the war goes on. But uh, for the most part, Canadians were embracing this war. It was the right war to fight. This was not a brush fire war like the Boer War. This was something much, much bigger. English Canadians supported the war out of a strong patriotic feeling for Great Britain. And since France was an ally, many French felt the same way. So. Uh, Prime Minister Borden, now keep in mind too, I should mention as we roll along here, Canada did not have an army, so we did not have um, a standing army. We had militias across this country, but militias were largely sort of private organizations, clubs if you will, of men who hung out on weekends, did shooting practice, you know, they wore uniforms, they talked about the virtues of the empire and so on and so forth and looked at maps and so forth had cigars and cognac. Um, so it was really much, militia was, were, were very much social organizations, but of course when war breaks out, because Canada doesn't have an army, the militia would be sort of the first ones that would be expected to, to sign up. Prime Minister Borden offered 25,000 troops, that would be Canadian troops, but 30,000 Canadians joined in the first month. So that is pretty telling. Remember that these are volunteers at this point. Uh, so our volunteer uh, interest had exceeded uh, our quota, if you will, by 5,000 in the first month. Volunteers thought the war would be short, exciting, heroic, 
while others joined for employment and escape from financial hardship, and some felt a patriotic urge to defend their mother country. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to consider that the generations of 1914 probably had a very uh, romanticized vision of warfare. You know, they're looking back on the, the great battles of the Napoleonic period. They're maybe looking back on you know, the religious wars in Europe, or they're even going back as far as the Roman Empire, that there was something exciting, noble, heroic, and honorable about war. So certainly there were those elements that uh, were, were enticed by those kind of um, um, ideas. Um, others who may be in between jobs or who may be dealing with economic hardship uh, recognize that by enlisting they're going to have three squares a day and uh, they're going to get paid. So, so for some people it was a financial thing. I would say that most of them felt a certain degree of patriotism towards Great Britain as well. At the end of the day though, if you're 17, 18, 19 years old, um, you know, and you're, you've just graduated from high school, and uh, you know, you, one of your friends signs up and he tells you, hey, I've enlisted, Chances are pretty good. You might do the same thing. I mean, you get to hang out with your chums, hopefully. <laughs> you get a uniform, you get training, you get a free pass to Europe. And you got to consider that people who lived in Canada, in small town Canada, whether it be somewhere in the middle of British Columbia or Flin Flon, Manitoba, or somewhere in between, most, people, most people's lives were regulated by the small community in which they lived. They looked in magazines and heard about Toronto and Montreal and New York. They certainly knew about Europe, but for them it was always in a history book. Um, so now, if you enlist, not only will you be with your friends and will you get an, you know, a kit, you'll get your uniform, a gun and everything in training, you're going to get a free ride on the CPR you know, that, that, depending on where you're leaving from, will uh, go straight across this country and then you'll take a ship across to Europe. So, you know, that might have been sort of the extent of where their thoughts were, not the actual combat part. Uh, that, of course, does come, but uh, for the most part, people did it because it was kind of exciting and you could support the mother country in the process. Many minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities and many others, including women, First Nations, African and Japanese Canadians, had to overcome racist attitudes to join, and when they were finally welcomed, most served their country well. You know, a lot of groups, particularly the Chinese Canadians, and, and certainly to some degree the African Canadians, saw in the war an opportunity to say, hey look, you know what, I'm tired of, of, of the crappy way you guys treat us. I'm tired of being discriminated against. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to defend my country, Canada. And the expectation, understandably, would be that I will be treated with dignity and respect once I've proven that I'm willing to defend um, my country. The irony was is that in the initial waves of, of people going to volunteer, these groups were de declined. Oh no, we don't need you. But as the war dragged on, uh, then, you know, uh, people that were uh, in, in charge of doing enlistments through the Canadian government said, oh, please, sorry, we, we turned you away back then. We, we, we need you now. Come on back. So, um, so a lot of people really wanted to show their loyalty and love of this country, even though for some of these people and some of these groups, they've been historically treated pretty bad by Canada. So, all right, well, because Canada did not have a standing army. You have to consider that when you are building an army in a country as large as Canada, it is an incredibly complex logistical feat. Now the current administration uh, under Robert Borden, he was the Prime Minister of Canada at the time, his Minister of Militia was a man named Sam Hughes. Now Sam Hughes has a long, long history in Canada's militia. He went to the Boer War. In fact, I believe Sam Hughes's both his grandparents fought in the Battle of Waterloo, that infamous battle which saw was kind of Napoleon's last stand. One of Sam Hughes's grandfathers fought under the British Wellington, 
the other fought under Napoleon. So, you know, he grew up hearing these stories from his parents. And uh, so he came from a very strong sort of lineage of, um, of um, you know, uh, of the, you know, the militia and the military. So as the minister of militia, he was given the huge task of training and supplying the troops with clothing and munitions. Now, this is no small affair. You've got to get all these men to one location. You've got to get them an outfit. You've got to get them a gun. You've got to get them trained. They have to have some basic training before they get to England. So, uh, once again, a huge task, considering nothing had been done on this scale before. After minimal basic training, in uh, 32,000 Canadian and Newfoundland troops set sail for England. I separated them because Newfoundland was still a British colony. Newfoundland would join Canada in 1949, after the Second World War. So they're all trained for the most part in Valcartier, Quebec, and off they go. When in England, Canadians developed a sense of, uh, of national identity, as troops from all over Canada met each other. You know, one of the refrains that we hear over and over is that World War I, or more specifically the Battle of Vimy Ridge is where Canada became a nation. It almost feels like an overused cliche. Um, but I believe there's no question that we did become a nation uh, due to the recognition we gained as a result of our success in battles like Vimy and later in Passchendaele as well. But I think where Canada, where Canadian soldiers developed their sense of national identity is when they were all put together for training in Salisbury Plain in England. Here you have 32,000 Canadians from Victoria, British Columbia to St. John's, Newfoundland and everywhere in between coming together, right? And well, like I say, somebody who grew up in Victoria could only dream of ever meeting someone from Newfoundland and vice versa. Well, here they were, you know, Sitting down, these thousands of men, having breakfast, elbow to elbow at a table. One might look over to his left and say, hey, my name's Eric. I am from Victoria. Where are you from? And the guy might look at me with a big grin and say, wow, well, I'm from Flin Flon, Manitoba. Are you really from Victoria? Yeah, I am. Ah, oh, geez, I hear it's like California out there. Well, I guess compared to Flin Flon, that might be the case. The next day, you might be sitting next to someone from Cape Breton Island whose accent is so thick, you're absolutely amazed that, that this fellow from Glace Bay, Nova Scotia is Canadian, right? Or you meet someone from Quebec who speaks predominantly French, right? So there was this kind of sense as Canadians began to rub shoulders with each other that the incredible mix of characters and regional dialects and personalities uh, and despite all their differences in that regard, what drew them together was the fact that they were all Canadian. So to me, that is such a pivotal moment uh, in, in Canadian soldiers developing sort of a national sense of, of identity. The army that was formed from these volunteers became known as the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Despite British assumptions that they would be absorbed, the CEF maintained its independence and fought as a separate unit. Now, we have to thank this fellow here. Very interesting personality, Sir Sam Hughes, and there's much to praise and there's much to criticize. Um, Sam Hughes was someone who had tendencies toward very erratic behaviors. He could, he was known to have incredible fits of anger and anguish and, and tears and, you know, people close to him and knew him appreciated his incredible love for Canada and a sense of nationalism, but many people were very concerned about his mental health. Now, not a lot of people would have used a term like mental health in 1914, um, but people kind of recognized that his erratic behavior at times could be quite troubling because he could really conflict with people and he could really rub people the wrong way, maybe because he was also so determined. Um, Sam Hughes is the one who, who made such a strong, persistent case that the Canadians do not be absorbed into the British Expeditionary Force, okay? Because what he was afraid of was that they just get spread out all over this huge British army and that the Canadians would just be sprinkled about, that they wouldn't be fighting. 
um, as Canadian units. Sam Hughes made the argument that if you keep them together and you let them fight as a separate Canadian unit within the umbrella, if you will, of the British Expeditionary Force, they will fight better, they will fight stronger, they will fight with greater determination because they'll be fighting together. And as much as the British command didn't want that to be the case, it's fair to say that Sam Hughes's persistence um, is what sort of allowed that to happen. Sam Hughes, as Minister of Militia, also oversaw the armament industry, and by 1917, Canada was supplying Britain with one-third of the shells used by British troops. Think about that. 33% of the bombs dropped by Britain throughout the war in Europe uh, were made in Canada. So, the problem is, and here's where the problems began, Hughes was a military, he was a militiaman, he was a good old boy, you know? And, and he wasn't really a good organization man, you know, and because what Hughes was responsible for doing was not only training all these troops, but ensuring that they all had a spade, shovel, a gun, blankets, rubber boots, all those things. And because Hughes was such a strong nationalist, he insisted that the, the, the boys in the Canadian Expeditionary Force, as it would soon be called, be using Canadian-made gear, right? So um, what ends up happening is he begins, you know, to kind of get bogged down in patronage. And what that means is that he gives people contracts to do things that are friends of his, you know. And the Canadian government was doling out a lot of money to get these boys training. So there was a lot of confusion, a lot of inefficiency in the mobilization of, of the things that were needed for the Canadian troops. I'll give you an example. By giving contracts to his profiteer friends in business, what results are poorly made boots, um, something called the McAdam shovel, the Ross rifle which tended to jam, and later British made Lee Enfield rifles were quickly taken from dead soldiers by Canadian troops. Okay, let's go through this one at a time. The, the boots that were made for Canadian soldiers had cardboard heels and insoles, and they were made from rubber. They were like gum boots, for lack of a better term, and you can only imagine what would happen to those gum boots in the, in the muddy fields of Flanders during the fall of 1914 and beyond. Um, they disintegrated in the mud of Europe, and, and you know, so, that was the first blunder that, you know, the, the, the um, Canadian troops recognized that the British and the Germans had, you know, leather boots that went up to the knee that, that tied up from the ankle to the, just below the knee, tight as a drum. And, you know, your boots in, 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 the, in the trenches was your lifeline because you do not want your feet to be chronically wet. We'll talk about the consequence of that a little later. So the boots were poorly made. The McAdam shovel was an interesting idea. The McAdam was, I believe, um, uh, uh, Sam Hughes's secretary. And he dubbed this inventive shovel after her. Basically what it was is it was a shovel that had a little hole in it. And I guess part of the logic was that, you know, if you're hiding behind a tree, you could... You could stick your eye in the hole and, you know, poke around and see if you can spot the enemy. If you get shot at, the shovel will, will protect you. Um, <laughs> the problem was is that when you plunge that shovel into the hard earth of, of, of France, they tended to collapse pretty easy. So the spade or shovel became useless too, as long as the boots, as long as the boots rather. Lastly, the Ross rifle. Now, I'll be perfectly honest, I'm not a military historian. I don't know a lot about the technology. But what I've read and what I have under understand about the Ross rifle, it is a Canadian-made rifle. It is a very good sort of one-shot sniper-type rifle. It was not designed to be reloaded, 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 because once they overheat, they begin to jam up. If they get wet, they jam up. And they were also known to backfire. So soldiers were losing their eyes because it was flying, you know, the bullets, the, the shrapnel of the bullets were exploding and, and, and coming backwards in their face. So what happens is that the Canadian troops are despondent because their feet are wet, their shovels don't work, and their guns are jamming up. So, what begins is the process of men 
willing to risk their lives crawling into no man's land in the middle of the night to remove the um, boots from a dead soldier and hopefully find a Lee Enfield rifle, which was the standard issue for British troops, and it was a much, much better gun. Eventually, the Canadian government realizes that a mistake had been made with the Ross rifle, and they begin to issue Lee Enfields to Canadians instead. Well, back at home, you know, you have a tremendous pressure now on the domestic home front. Uh, Borden, the Prime Minister, realized the need for complete government control of the economy. The War Measures Act, as it was called, allowed the government to intervene directly in the economy of the country and control transportation, manufacturing, trade and agriculture production in whatever way it deemed necessary. So all businesses would have to understand that they would be in service of the Canadian war effort. Most businesses were obliged. I mean, if you were a, a newspaper company and you were asked to make, you know, I don't know, rubber boots, you would do it because, uh, you know, you would still be making money. You would, you know, it, it, it would still be good for business, but, but there's this incredible sort of mobilization of all fronts of the economy to gear towards the war. The Act also gave the government the power to strip Canadians, sorry, need apostrophe there, of their civil liberties, uh, like opening mail, arresting without warrants or court procedures, or deportations of suspected enemies. The other problem, well, a problem rather, with the War Measures Act is it gave the Canadian government the right to basically spy on any Canadian. And you have to consider that in the huge wage of, of immigration that happened during the 1890s to 1914, when upwards of 2 million people came, many of them were German. And the fear was that <clears throat> we need to keep an eye on people of German descent because um, they might be more loyal to their previous country than they are to Canada. And uh, so uh, anybody that was from a country that we were currently at war at, Austrians would be under the gun, Hungarians would be, even some Ukrainians, because part of the Ukraine was under the, um, the, the border of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So that's why Ukrainians were interned. Um, and of course, Germans, you know. There's quite a story in Victoria, British Columbia, where we had a, a brewery here in Victoria that was quite popular and made very good beer. And after the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, a, a mob burst down town Victoria with pitchforks and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and um, torches and, and destroyed this brewery out of an anti-German letting out of anger and of course a couple of days later everyone kind of went oh geez we just uh, destroyed our source of beer uh, so they're going to have to drink other inferior beers I guess at that point but uh, you know this kind of thing happened across the country you know this this anger towards anybody who was German. Many new immigrants from Germany and Austria-Hungary were treated harshly under the act. Half a million were required to carry identity cards and regularly report to authorities and another 8,500 uh, were held in isolation internment camps. So people that were usually deemed as a problem uh, were interned. That means temporarily put away and uh, they, you know, these, these internment camps weren't necessarily brutal or anything but you know, certainly they were denied their civil liberties. Interestingly enough, the majority of people that were in these internment camps were oftentimes kind of um, uh, you know, activist labor leaders. And in a way, this war and the internment camps became a reason for the Canadian government to kind of do away with people in society that were already causing trouble. And, uh, but the excuse could be made that it was for the war and we need to protect ourselves against the Austrians and the Ukrainians and Germans and, and others as well. So, all right. So, Lots to talk about, and uh, once again, um, we're focusing here on the Canadian effort. So there's going to be a lot of battles we're not going to talk about that are extremely important, but it just so happens that Canada wasn't involved in them. In a very general sense, though, when we get to the, the planning of war and how war, was, how war was going to be fought, we know that the Germans were already thinking about this in 1905 when they developed something called the Schlieffen Plan. Um, it was an invasion of France through Belgium, the taking of Paris, then a sweep across Europe to defeat 
Russia. I don't have a map of the um, Schlieffen Plan, but the Schlieffen Plan is not terribly extraordinary. It's pretty straightforward, but what makes the Schlieffen Plan relevant and important in the narrative of World War I is the fact that 10 years before the war starts, uh, German military uh, personnel were already thinking about how to win the war if we go to war. So uh, they were already getting into that mindset and planning for what they appear to be in indicating that war was inevitable. By August 1914 and 35 kilometers from Paris, the Germans were exhausted and they dug a defensive line of trenches. The Allies did the same a few miles away. You know, the war was mobile for maybe a month, month and a half. Mobile meaning that people are marching and moving and heading. But the moment enemies met each other, that was it. Because then the realization of the impact of modern technology on warfare began to show. This was not going to be two grand armies at Austerlitz or Jena in a grand Napoleonic style you know, waving flags and then running towards each other on horseback. This was a war that had incredible technology and the most brutal of them all was the impact of the machine gun. That if you can spray bullets across a, an open field of men running towards you, you can imagine the casualty rate. So basically what happens is the recognition is that we have to protect ourselves from gunfire and mortar fire, so we're going to dig down because we don't want to retreat. We might not be able to move forward, but we don't want to retreat either, so let's dig down. Eventually, a network of trenches extends from the English Channel to the Swiss border. Between the two trenches lay no man's land, a terrible wasteland of corpses, barbed wire, and mud. And by Christmas 1914, both sides were locked in a stalemate with neither side advancing nor retreating. So there was literally thousands of kilometers of trenches that extended from the Swiss border to, to, to the coast, up the French coast. And, you know, they didn't necessarily all connect with each other. There were sometimes gaps in between them, but there would be like branches of trenches and a labyrinth of these things, you know, all through. And, you know, the thinking was it all became about holding your ground holding the ground. You know, by Christmas 1914, those poor boys who had thought that it would be a quick war, would be heroic and over by Christmas, realized the grim reality that this was not the case. And Christmas Eve 1914 was one of the most remarkable moments of this whole war. And the Christmas truce only ever happened once in 1914 on this scale. And I'll just give you a quick rundown of what the Christmas truce was, because to me it's one of the, 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 the moments of hope, of, 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 of friendship, of community, camaraderie, in a war that, that, that showed very little of that between enemies. But this was a unique situation. Basically what happens is there's one, it happened in several places by the way, it didn't just happen in one place, but the, most, the one that's most reported is the one that involved, I believe, French and Scottish troops on one side and Germans on the other. And what happens is the French and the Scots are in their trenches and all of a sudden they hear a melody. And it's Christmas Eve and they recognize the melody as Silent Night, Holy Night. So the Scottish begin to sing it because they know it, because they, it's part of their tradition. I mean, Silent Night, Holy Night is an old German song. So a lot of the the, the, a lot of the Christmas carols that we know, many of them are actually started in Germany. And we adopted them into English and kept the melody. Uh, <clears throat> then the Scots begin to sing, and, and it gets loud and loud and loud. And then, very daringly, some poked their head over the trench to see what was going on. And of course, that's always a risk. You never poke your head over the trench. Certainly not in the day, because there were snipers on the other side just waiting to pick people off. Um, so, and as a footnote, a lot of young men died because in the evenings they would step, stretch their legs and they, didn't, they figured, well, the enemy can't see me and they'd be having a smoke. And as they drew the cigarette and the, and the, the end of it turned red and amber red, it was like a beacon for the snipers to boom. A lot of young men died that way. Um, so what happens is... When the Scots and French look over, they see on the back side of the German trench all these little trees standing on, on you know, little stands. And they have colored balls on them and tinsel. 
And a lot of people know the Christmas tree had not be, become part of um, Western Europe's tradition. It, it was born in Germany, just like many of the carols. And some may have recognized it, but many of them were thinking, what on earth are these little trees, you know? And the, the German soldiers were issued Christmas trees by the, by the German leadership just before uh, Christmas. And eventually, long and short, white flags come up, and the troops, you know, the commanding officers meet in the middle, they agree to a truce. The troops come out, they share things, they laugh, they drink. The truce goes on to Christmas Day the next day, they play soccer. Uh, which would have been difficult in no man's land, I'm sure. They get an opportunity to retrieve all the bodies and bury their comrades. Um, and then by Christmas, or Boxing Day, the 26th, uh, at a certain time, I can't remember the time, if it was midnight on Christmas night or whenever it was. Either way, whenever it was, then war continued. Uh, this was not supposed to happen. This was not a direct, this was an impulsive action that happened in the trenches. When the generals who made the decisions about the, the, how the war was being navigated heard about the Christmas truce, they said, under no circumstances can this ever happen again. This is fraternizing with the enemy. This goes against everything we need to do to fight this war. And I can only imagine how difficult it would have been for those poor boys who, who felt like they made these connections with these German soldiers, many of whom were like them, you know. Oh my gosh, he's a farmer like me, has three children. He's an accountant, he's a teacher, he's a lawyer. Those troops realized that they had so much in common, they were both suffering, that questions were like, why are we fighting anyway? Why are we doing this, right? And uh, anyway, after 1914, the hammer went down and uh, you know, you never saw Christmas truce again. You might have seen situations in 15, 16, and 17 where people might agree just not to shoot each other or to drop bombs on each other for Christmas Day, but other than that, you didn't see the kind of thing as you did in 1914, so. Basically, the new technology were the big part of the horror of this war. Uh, machine guns, airplanes, tanks, all required and required new tactics that nobody had thought. You know, you have to consider too, and I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, that when World War I starts in 1914, it had literally been 100 years since the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So there was nobody alive who remembered warfare on that scale. Yes, there were regional conflicts. The Crimean War grew into something a little bigger, though. Uh, the Franco-Prussian War and the Wars of German uh, Unification. But, you know, you'd never seen anything like this. So you, you, a lot of the policymakers are going into World War I with kind of a 19th century uh, framework, but fighting with 20th century technology, and those two worlds collide. You know, and this was a big part of it. You need the rec people were recognizing that we can't fight. We have to find new ways of fighting this war. Here's a picture of a uh, British troop lighting the cigarette of a German troop. This would have been probably the Christmas truce, I would assume, or maybe it would have been when one of them were captured. I like the picture, though. And there's a picture of what the trench looked like as well. So. Uh, the result was a war of attrition for three more years, resulting in millions of deaths. Okay, so let's talk a bit about a war of attrition, what that means. A war of attrition basically means that you are going to throw as many men as you can at the enemy and eventually you will overcome them. That's why there was so much loss in life, because the generals lacked creativity and all they could think was every now and again they had to send their boys over the top. Even though a high percentage of them would be slaughtered, at least you're making an effort. You needed to look like you were making an effort. And the result of that was brutal, because when the enemy is fighting a war of attrition as well, you could imagine the consequences. So, you know, as the war rolls out, it becomes very, very clear that it's going to be nearly unwinnable. Trenches. Here you can see some pictures of people hanging out in their trench. Pretty horrible. Look at all the water and mud. That's why you need good boots. Trenches were cold and damp in winter and flooded with heavy rain. Oh boy, soldiers had to deal with rats, disease, lice infestations, trench foot, serious injury, created a stinking cesspool of miserable conditions. The rats 
were relentless in the trenches and they were huge rats, this big not including the tail. Unfortunately the reason there was such a presence of rats because there was lots of food and unfortunately they had dead bodies to feed on. Um, lice were chronic uh, because you know these soldiers didn't get the opportunity to bathe. They might be in the trenches for weeks without a bath. Um, trench foot is a consequence of your feet being wet all the time and this is coming back to what happened with Canadian troops and their rubber boots that you know you were willing to risk your life to get a hold of some really good clean wool socks and a pair of leather boots that tied to just below the kneecap um, because what happens is that you know not only are your feet wet but they're exposed to water that is polluted with with shrapnel and gunpowder and blood and it's just horrible toxic stuff and you know at the end of the day when you went to bed you know which was usually you know they would dig into the side of the trench and you'd be underground they'd build a frame and you'd be basically sleeping behind the trench um, you know you'd be dying to take off your boots and uh, take off your socks and let your feet dry out because if you didn't and your feet were chronically wet that leads to something called trench foot which basically is gangrene which means that your feet begin to rot and I didn't post any pictures of trench foot because it's pretty horrible looking stuff. You can look it up online if you want. But uh, those are the conditions in which they live. Now the problem was, is that when soldiers took off their socks and their boots to have their feet dry out, as they slept the rats would come out and sometimes you'd wake up screaming because there'd be a toe nibbling on your infected toes. And then so you'd have to put your socks back on. So you got a choice. You either end up with trench foot because you got to wear your boots as you sleep or you allow the rats to nibble on your feet, which is not something you want to happen. So it, it was an incredibly claustrophobic, horrible environment that these young men had to deal with. In the Belgian city of Ypres, I've heard Ypres or Ypres. On April 22nd, 1915, Canadian and French troops were blinded, burned, or killed by chlorine gas, even though the use of gas for military purposes had been banned by international agreement. Okay, Ypres, April 1915 was the first action that the Canadians saw on the Western Front, and it was the first time that gas was used, which means that those troops at that time had no idea when they saw these clouds crawling their way towards them because you could see the gas. You could see it looked like a white cloud. And, uh, you know, there was no way of knowing what it was until it reached your nostrils and your lungs and then you began to choke. So horrible, horrible stuff. Uh, when, you know, when you begin to resort to gas warfare, you know, you've reached an all-time low in warfare. So 6,000 Canadians would be killed wounded or captured on the fields of Flanders near Ypres. So it was a horrible wake-up call for what this war was really all about. <clears throat> In July 1916 on the Somme River, British French forces under the command of General Haig, General Douglas Haig, lost nearly three million casualties. Okay, 24,000 of whom were Canadian. Three million casualties. Now, Casualties and deaths are two different statistics. Deaths are soldiers that died. Casualties are soldiers in, that have died, but also those who have either lost a leg or those people directly impacted by the war. So if you, if a soldier dies, you know, his, um, or loses an arm or ability to see, or he's basically a casualty. But when you tally up all the numbers at the end, when a soldier dies, his wife and kids are casualties too, right? Because they have no father. So um, casualties are always higher, of course, than death rates. Haig's use of outdated tactics were largely to blame for the high casualties. Douglas Haig is like the supreme, I don't know his, his exact title, sort of a supreme allied commander of all British expeditionary forces. He makes the major decisions and then things happen. He was a military man of the old school, and his problem was that he lacked ingenuity and creativity. All he could imagine doing was just to keep throwing men at the, at the enemy. And, 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 you know, I definitely feel for Hank, because I don't think he was a bad guy. I don't think he was malevolent or anything like that. He just simply lacked creativity. And that's why eventually 
people begin to say, hey, wait a second here, I might have some ideas because this war of attrition and blindly sending men over the top isn't working. So, look at this in the song. 85% of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, over 700 men, including officers, were killed or wounded in half an hour, in 30 minutes. Why? Because when those Royal Newfoundland troops arrived, they were fresh, they were trained, they were ready to go. They ran over the top like they were told, and they got machine gunned down, just like everybody else, right? So, pretty tragic. All right. So, by 1917, the Canadians had four divisions, each of which was comprised of close to 10,000 men, which gave Canada the ability to put 40,000 Canadians in active duty at one time. If a situation arose where that could happen. Of course it does at Vimy. Despite the tragedy of the Somme, Canadians had developed what came to be known as the Creeping Barrage. Now I want to be clear that the ideas of the Creeping Barrage, had the French had been experimenting with this idea. Um, you could almost argue that in a way guerrilla warfare, sort of the tactics used by the Boers in the Boer War, or even by the Spaniards in the in the Napoleonic Wars, you could go back and, and argue that maybe that's a type of creeping barrage, okay? Let me just explain what this means, because it's very, very important in setting this up for the Battle of Vimy Ridge. <clears throat> if a war of attrition are two, two um, trenches facing each other with, with no man's land in between, you're sending boys over the top, blindly, just go, run, machine gun in hand, run at the enemy, and you're getting slaughtered. Creeping barrage might look something like this. What we're going to do is we're going to send an artillery barrage over to the enemy trench. And at the moment that that hits the trench or near it, there's going to be confusion for 30 seconds. The enemy is going to be coughing, going like this, waiting for the smoke to settle. In that brief moment of confusion, a line of troops gets up, moves out X amount of meters, let's call it 25 meters, and gets down on their belly. When the smoke clears, the enemy looks around, they don't see anything. And then another artillery barrage is sent by the Canadians. Poof, confusion. Those troops on the ground get up, move another 25 feet forward, and then another line comes out. And it basically staggers itself. So by the fourth barrage, when the smoke clears on the German trench, they look up and the Canadians are looking down on them and on top of their trench. That's the ideal situation. But more than that, it's a coordination between the infantry as well as the artillery. Infantry are the foot soldiers, artillery are the weaponry. So you're going to coordinate those things, everything's going to be timed, and everything's going to be organized in such a way to reduce casualties and increase the probability of being victorious. This method saw tactics as paramount. The futile losses of the Somme proved the needs for tactics, and many people who lived through that horrible battle said, okay, this is not working. Time for some changes. Uh, the British High Command acknowledged this new barrage and ordered the Canadians to perfect this method using all four Canadians together. And the stage for Vimy Ridge had been set. So, um, someone like Arthur Curry, Curry who we're going to talk about, uh, was already thinking about this, already sort of planning the idea of, of actually implementing tactics that might, uh, might get the job done. So. All right, well, Arthur Curry is sort of uh, one of the great Canadian heroes of World War I. He was the architect for the most part of Vimy Ridge. He was instrumental in the Battle of Passchendaele and uh, the events that led up to the end of the war. So from a Canadian perspective, he's kind of, kind of the main guy, I think. And uh, he was born in Ontario in 1875. He would move to British Columbia in 1894. Worked as a teacher in Victoria and Sydney. He was 19 years old when he came to Victoria. I believe his maternal great aunt lived here. He was coming from Strathroy, Ontario. He had left because I believe his father had just died recently in addition to the fact that he had entered a teacher training program after high school and then he got in a conflict with the teacher and it didn't work out, he was frustrated, and I think he just wanted a new start. Uh, some friends of his were heading out to Vancouver on their relatively newly built CPR, which at that time was only nine years old. 
So for $25, he traveled from Ontario to Vancouver, British Columbia, took the CPR steamships from Vancouver to Victoria, and that's where he got started. Um, when he got to Victoria, he didn't know anybody. He was 19 years old. He was a farm boy. Um, he had no military background in his family or his history. And he, uh, you know, Victoria, British Columbia at this time was, was probably one of the most English cities in Canada. There's a very strong English element. And part of that English element was a very sort of strong class structure. You know, everybody wanted to be hanging out with the upper classes, with, with the military leaders. And, you know, I think for Curry, getting involved in the militia was an opportunity for him to connect socially, but also to kind of get a glimpse into a different world that he might not have been exposed to. He joined the 5th Regiment Canadian Garrison Artillery as a gunner. By 1900, he achieved the rank of corporal. Um, he was offered an officer's commission, which required he purchase his own tailored uniforms and donate his small teacher salary to the officer's mess. You know, so this is where this, you know, where it becomes problematic. You got to have money. The higher up in the ranks you get up in the British Army, the more you're expected to spend, right? So, you know, it's getting pretty expensive, and on a small teacher salary, it's uh, definitely a challenge. He uh, married a woman in Victoria, um, strong English stock, and the small salary in teaching, he joined the world of finance and business. So he decides, through connections he made in the militia, to get out of teaching and maybe get involved in business. Because, you know, hey, if you're good at business, you can make more money. He continued to show passion for artillery and marksmanship, rising to captain in 1902 and major in 1906 with the 5th Regiment Canadian Garrison Artillery. During a speculation boom, he invested in the real estate market, and by 1909, he had risen to lieutenant colonel. His financial fortunes are rising. He's buying properties on behalf of his company, and he's making a lot of money in the process. Plus, he's rising in the, um, in the uh, militia. But in 1913, the real estate market went bust, which meant that all the properties that he and his company um, his investment company with Sam Matson that he was involved with, the prices collapsed, which meant that he, well, he didn't have any money, right? Because the properties that he owned were now near worthless. And he was left holding worthless properties right at the same time he was asked to command the newly formed 50th Gordon Highlanders, a new Scottish regiment in Victoria. Because in Victoria you had the 5th... Uh, um, Canadian Garrison Artillery, you also had one called the 88th Fusiliers, which was a predominantly English um, regiment. And there was a desire, because there was a significant Scottish presence in Victoria, to have a Scottish Highland Regiment. And he, even, he was the guy um, asked to put it together. His mess bills, the new uniforms, nearly crippled him financially, and he would divert over $10,000 earmarked for regiment uniforms into his personal bank account to settle debts and avoid financial disgrace and embarrassment and likely loss of his post in the Highlanders. Okay, so let me just explain this a little better. A local businessman in Victoria said that he, was, he, he, he would like to donate $10,000, I think, to this new regiment. So Curry was of the understanding that money was coming in as a donation. To, to because Highland uniforms are very expensive, they got to be made in Scotland, blah, blah, blah. Because Curry was dead broke, what he does is he spends $10,000 that are given to him through by the federal government for his regiment, thinking that I'll use this money, right, to pay my bills, this Canadian government money, and when that $10,000 comes in from the donation, I'll use that for, you know, so, so he's kind of, fudging it a bit, but you know, there wasn't really anything that said, we need a checklist of what you're spending on. Here's $10,000, buy uniforms, buy everything you need. And for, as far as he was concerned, then that was completely legit. Until the guy who was going to donate the $10,000 said, oh, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to do it. So he was left holding the bag. He'd spent the $10,000 of federal money. And although he wasn't broke now, now he was in a real pickle. <laughs> 
Before he had time to settle the debt, he was sent to Europe in 1914, and boy, he had that hanging over his head the whole time. And eventually, friends back in Victoria would help him settle the debt, so they would pay it for him, and then he would pay them back later. So, um, The reason I think it's important, some people say, well, geez, why do you talk about this with our great hero? I said, well, you know, because he was a man. He was a flawed character, you know. He made an impulsive decision. Um, and he regretted it. And I think in many ways what's important about this is that he, he felt such a, a sense of, of, of you know, uh, what's the word? You know, he just felt completely humiliated about this whole situation. That he was going to go to Europe and he was going to make amends. He was going to make it right. And I think in many ways the mistakes that he left in Victoria when he left really became sort of the, 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 what fueled his strong desire to prove himself, make his contribution extremely significant. So, so he would become the senior divisional commander charged with planning this barrage um, in a battle at, at Vimy. Completely new to strategy was Curry's idea that all men in the unit were placed in exact locations at precise predetermined times. Then remember we talked about discussions about the creeping barrage. Now that Canada had been given the role of taking Vimy Ridge, this is when he says, look, okay, thank you, and this is how we're going to do it. Um, each soldier, regardless of place, received a map and very precise instructions. When the Canadians were given the task of taking Vimy, Arthur Curry requested that they have a significant amount of time to rehearse the battle. In addition to that, he requested 35,000 maps or whatever it was so that each soldier could have a map. And the um, British leadership were like, what on earth do you need all these maps for? And he said, because I want all my soldiers to know exactly where they are and everybody's going to have a very distinct purpose of what they're going to be doing on the day of this battle. So I think the British kind of rolled their eyes. Okay, fine, we'll get you the map. So they got everyone a map. They rehearsed this battle. They, you know, a, a, a mock sort of... Um, model of Vimy was built and troops would be brought in to discuss where they're going to be, where they're going to go, how they're going to do it. Um, Vimy Ridge was one of the most, I know I've heard this in several different sources, maybe a, not the most, but one of the most rehearsed battles in military history up to that point. So, What followed in February, March 1917 was entirely new according to Pierre Burton, because whole divisions were taken behind lines to practice the Vimy Glide. Okay, the Vimy Glide. It gets complicated, but let's look at it this way. Let's say this is the width of Vimy Ridge. You've got four divisions. One, two, three, four. All lined up next to each other. Okay. So what the plan is, is that instead of all those troops going over the top and heading up at the same time. The goal is to have Division 1, I don't know if you can see my hands here, Division 1 go up first, and then the second, and then the third. So the troops are kind of sweeping up this way. When the Germans on the top see what's going on, they all go, oh my gosh, they're flanking us on our uh, right, right hand side, so all the German troops move over to the right to confront the Canadians that are coming up. But then the other troops are sweeping up along, it was, a, it was like a, a glide. Completely new and innovative, so that was a huge, huge part of the success of this battle. We'll talk about the details of the battle when we get there. Again and again, they played out the battle in dress rehearsal to perfect the precise timing of each expected halt and advance. While the Canadians were spending several months training for this, the British were thinking, boy, oh boy, these Canadians better know what they're doing. Um, and, you know, you have to consider that there was a little bit of that sort of colonial mentality that, you know, the British were, were kind of like the great, were the top of the pile and, you know, we'll smile at our colonial brothers, you know, the New Zealanders and the South Asians and the Canadians and everybody else, but, but you guys are just colonial. So I think the British High Command were perplexed by all this planning, but they were willing to give it a try because there was nothing to lose because nothing else was working anyway. So, that being said, I want to save the Battle of Vimy Ridge for part two of this lecture and uh, that's where we will begin. Um,
So, uh, yeah, so I strongly uh, suggest you look at uh, part two, Canada and World War I part two, because it's in that one we're going to talk about um, Passchendaele, we're going to talk about Vimy, and we're also going to come back and look at the impact that the war continues to have on the home front. So, anyway, thank you very much for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time uh, for Canada in World War I part two. Thank you.